Welcome to Los Angeles, the city of angels. I'll take you on a tour of the largest city in California and the second most populous city in the US, having some 3.9 million residents within city limits. In this episode, we'll focus on the downtown area with its historic buildings, skyscrapers, unique places, and it's also a melting pot of many different cultures coming together, highlighted by different ethnic neighborhoods such as El Pueblo, Chinatown, and Little Tokyo. Now, when you visit downtown LA, you will also encounter the struggles this massive city is dealing with, such as a large homeless population. When visiting, you will likely encounter tents on some sidewalks and people with addictions that might behave irrational. I just want to make sure you are aware of this as oftentimes people, especially international visitors, just see the glitz and glamour side of LA on TV. Despite these struggles, I think LA is still a great city to visit and is one of my favorite cities, which is why I've lived in the LA area for a long time. And with that, let's go ahead and start the tour. Los Angeles is located in Southern California along the Pacific Ocean. Known for its Mediterranean climate and popular beach cities such as Santa Monica, Venice and Malibu, Beverly Hills with all of the massive mansions and luxurious shopping boutiques, Hollywood for the film industry and then there is downtown LA with one of the most impressive skylines in the world. We start the tour at Union Station, head over to Olvera Street, which is the birthplace of Los Angeles, continue to Chinatown before heading southwest to the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels. Next stop is the architectural masterpiece Walt Disney Concert Hall and then the unique Angels Flight. We continue to the historic Biltmore Hotel and Pershing Square before passing the original pantry, an iconic eatery in LA. Close by is the Hotel Figueroa and across the street we get to LA Live, a massive entertainment and dining complex adjacent to the Crypto.com arena where the LA Lakers, Clippers and Kings play. From here we head back walking northeast to the last bookstore and on to Grand Central Market which is across the street from the Bradbury building. We pass City Hall on our way to the last stop of the tour, Little Tokyo. Here we are at Union Station, the transportation center of the city. Not only is it the main railway station for Amtrak trains, but also serves as a transportation hub for various modes of transit, including the Metrolink commuter rail system, Los Angeles Metro Rail, and numerous bus lines. This is also where you would arrive if you take the flyaway bus from the LAX airport. I provide more info on that in my LAX airport video linked in the description below. Besides being the transportation hub of the city, Union Station has also become a major landmark. It was built in 1939 and is an iconic example of Art Deco and Spanish colonial revival architectural styles. This historic building is really worth visiting even if you don't arrive by train or bus. The main waiting room with its high ceilings, chandeliers and tiled floors evokes a sense of nostalgia. Union Station has been featured in numerous commercials, TV shows and films such as Blade Runner, Pearl Harbor, Catch Me If You Can and The Dark Knight Rises. Note that the station also houses several shops, restaurants and cafes. Right across the street from Union Station we get to El Pueblo de Los Angeles Historic Monument. It holds a significant cultural and historic importance as the birthplace of Los Angeles and a vibrant center of Mexican and Latino culture. Established in 1781, El Pueblo de la Reina de Los Angeles was the original settlement that eventually grew into the modern day city of Los Angeles. At the center is the old plaza which is surrounded by several preserved historic buildings. This is the iconic Plaza Church, also known as La Iglesia de Nuestra Señora Reina de Los Angeles, the Church of Our Lady Queen of the Angels. This historic Catholic church was built in 1822, making it one of the city's oldest surviving structures. Its architectural style reflects the Mission Revival and Spanish Colonial Revival influences, with its adobe walls, simple facade and distinct bell tower. The interior features beautiful artwork including statues, paintings and ornate altars. 
Today, the church continues to serve as an active place of worship and a cultural landmark. Right next to the church you find this little walkway with a memorial garden which used to be a small cemetery where approximately 693 early residents of Los Angeles were buried. This is the Pico House built by Pio Pico, the last governor of California under Mexican rule. This was the first three-story building and the first grand hotel in Los Angeles. Construction began in September 1869 and the hotel opened for business on June 9, 1870. This is the Plaza Firehouse. Built in 1884, it was the first building to be constructed by the city of Los Angeles for housing, firefighting equipment and personnel. In 1897, the building's life as a fire station ended and over the following years it was used as a saloon, boarding house, cigar store and pool room. In 1953, when the El Pueblo Historic Monument was established, the building was restored and firefighting equipment and memorabilia was installed, making it a museum which it still is today. And now we get into the heart of El Pueblo, Olvera Street, a bustling marketplace featuring a vibrant collection of shops, restaurants and street vendors offering traditional Mexican handicrafts, clothing, jewelry and delicious food. You'll be immersed in the sights, sounds and flavors of Mexico as you stroll through this narrow and picturesque street. You'll also find the Avila Adobe here on Olvera Street. Being built in 1818, it's the oldest standing residence in the city. Throughout the year, El Pueblo hosts various festivals, performances and cultural events that showcase the vibrant traditions and artistic expressions of the Mexican and Latino communities. These celebrations attract locals and tourists alike. I went to the Dia de los Muertos celebrations last year and highly recommend it if you find yourselves in the area on this special day. Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead, is a colorful Mexican holiday celebrated on November 1st and 2nd each year. It is a time to honor and remember deceased loved ones and to celebrate the continuity of life and death. During Dia de los Muertos, families and communities come together to create elaborate altars called ofrendas, adorned with photographs, favorite foods, flowers, candles, and other personal items that represent the lives of the departed. These altars are meant to welcome and guide the spirits of loved ones back to the earthly realm for a brief reunion. The celebration is characterized by its festive and joyful atmosphere. The holiday is also marked by parades, processions, and lively street festivals. Participants often paint their faces as colorful calacas, skeletons, or calaveras, skulls, and wear vibrant traditional clothing. Before we move on, I just briefly want to mention that there are parking lots in the vicinity of El Pueblo. So if you arrive by car, this would be the place to park to start this walking tour of downtown LA. Alright, now let's continue to Chinatown. At the intersection of Caesar E. Chavez Avenue and North Broadway, you'll see the Chinatown Gateway Monument, also known as the Dragon Gate, featuring two dragons ushering in good luck and harmony. This serves as the gateway into Chinatown on the southern end of the neighborhood. A quick side note before we continue into Chinatown, if you turn right onto Ord Street from North Broadway, you'll get to Felipe the Original, a historic deli established in LA in 1908, and it has been at its current location since 1951. In 1918, the French dip sandwich was created at Felipe's by accident, and to this day their signature French dip sandwich is what they are known for. Alright, now let's continue our tour. Chinatown serves as a hub for Chinese American culture, cuisine and community. The origins of Chinatown in Los Angeles date back to the late 19th century when Chinese immigrants settled in the area. Over the years, the neighborhood has evolved and transformed, reflecting the changing demographics and cultural influences. 
Today it stands as a bustling enclave that celebrates Chinese heritage and offers a unique experience for both locals and visitors alike. Speaking of celebrating Chinese heritage, the Lunar New Year celebration is a huge festival here in Chinatown featuring colorful parades, dragon dances, and fireworks. I'll leave you with some impressions from this year's festivities where the community rang in the Year of the Rabbit. The architecture and design of Chinatown are reminiscent of traditional Chinese styles blended with modern elements. Ornate gateways, colorful lanterns and decorative facades adorn the streets creating a distinctive atmosphere. Here we are at Central Plaza, the heart of Chinatown, which features a beautiful pagoda and courtyard offering a space for community gatherings. On the other side of the plaza, on North Hill Street, we see the west gate of Chinatown and right here, Rush Hour with Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker was filmed. Besides a wide range of authentic Chinese cuisine, you'll also find other cuisines such as Vietnamese here. I highly recommend this little hole in the wall eatery, Tien Huang Restaurant. Their banh mi, which are Vietnamese sandwiches, are so delicious. The neighborhood is also home to vibrant markets and specialty stores where you can find a variety of Chinese herbs, spices, produce, fish and other cultural products. It's really interesting walking through these marketplaces and you truly feel immersed in Chinese culture. Alright, we continue our tour and head over to the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels. As we walk along North Hill Street, we pass the Fort Moore Pioneer Memorial, a historic landmark which pays tribute to the early settlers and pioneers who played a significant role in the city's development. The memorial stands on the site of Fort Moore, a former military outpost that existed during the mid-19th century. The memorial was dedicated to commemorate the American settlers who defended the fort during the Mexican-American War. Just a few steps further, we get to this bridge that goes over the 101 freeway. In the distance to the right, you see this interesting building, which is part of the Ramon Cortines School of Visual and Performing Arts. To the left, we get our first glimpse of the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels, a prominent Catholic cathedral which was completed in 2002. As a spiritual and architectural landmark, the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels serves as a place of worship reflection and community for Catholics in Los Angeles and beyond. Its striking exterior features a facade adorned with large bronze doors and a 300-foot bell tower. I was not able to go inside as they won't let you enter the cathedral with a camera, so keep this in mind when you are visiting. From the cathedral we make a left onto Grand Avenue. On one side of the street we see Grand Park, where you can take a moment to relax for a bit. And in the distance, we get a glimpse of the LA City Hall building. We'll be over there on the other side of the park later on our tour. And then across the street from Grand Park, we see the Music Center, the third largest performing arts center in the US. The compound includes the Amundsen Theater, which showcases plays and musicals. The Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, which is the largest of the four Music Center venues. It served as a home to the LA Philharmonic for decades and it was also the site for more than 20 Academy Awards presentations from 1969 to 1999. It is now home to the LA Opera. The third venue within the complex is the Mark Taper Forum, which is the smallest and most intimate theater of the Music Center and was designed for the production of dramas and experimental theater. 
And now we get to the fourth venue, the Walt Disney Concert Hall, which was completed in 2003 and is undoubtedly an architectural masterpiece designed by renowned architect Frank Gehry. It has become a modern icon of the city and is home to the LA Philharmonic and the Los Angeles Master Chorale. The concert hall is one of the most acoustically sophisticated in the world, providing both visual and oral intimacy for a singular musical experience. For all you photographers out there, this is certainly a place you want to see. You can get some awesome shots here, it's especially great for black and white photography. Across the street from the Walt Disney Concert Hall, you'll see the Grand LA, another architectural masterpiece designed by Frank Gehry. It offers a mix of commercial, retail, cultural and residential units stitched together with grand public spaces. With chef-driven restaurants, a collection of shops, a movie theater complex, a hotel, the Conrad by Hilton, the Grand LA was constructed to revitalize Grand Avenue and make it a cultural and civic core of downtown LA. Just a few steps further, at the corner of Grand and 2nd Street, is the Broad, a contemporary art museum. The general admission is free, however, some exhibitions and events carry a charge. Note that even for the free admission, you do need to reserve a time ticket in advance. The Broad is home to the popular Infinity Mirror Room, which you may have seen on social media. We continue on Grand Avenue and after a short walk make a left into the One California Plaza Complex. You'll find some eateries here, but several storefronts are empty. In the center you'll find this little area for events and as you look up you see One Cal Plaza, a 176 meters or 577 foot skyscraper. With its unique vertical profile of curved reflective glass crowned by a neon halo, the 42-story tower strikes a memorable silhouette against the Los Angeles skyline. A second skyscraper, Tucal Plaza, comprises the California Plaza area. And right here at the plaza is also where you can get on Angel's Flight, which is often referred to as the shortest railway in the world. It consists of two funicular railway cars that transport passengers up and down a steep hill. It opened in 1901 as a convenient and efficient transportation option for residents living in the Bunker Hill neighborhood to get from Hill Street to the California Plaza and vice versa. The distinctive orange funicular cars add a sense of nostalgia and charm to the area. The ride costs $1 each way or 50 cents if you have a metro card. Adding to that nostalgia are the wooden benches inside the cars. It takes about one minute to get from the top to the bottom of the railway. Angel's Flight has been featured in several movies such as La La Land. It's certainly a pretty unique experience. That said, if you check out my Heidelberg, Germany video, you can see another funicular railway which takes you up a hill to the castle. I'll leave a link to that video in the description below. The lower station of Angel's Flight is on Hill Street, right across the street from Grand Central Market, which we will visit later as we continue our tour further southeast before circling back here later. Now we get to Pershing Square, an urban park spanning six acres, making it a gathering place. It was blocked off while I was there, as various events take place here, such as concerts, art installations, seasonal festivals, including an ice skating rink during the winter months. All the way up there on that building's rooftop is Perch, a glamorous French restaurant. It's a really cool spot that I highly recommend. It's quite expensive, but certainly worth it in my opinion. And then here we have the Millennium Biltmore Hotel, a historic and iconic luxury hotel which opened in 1923. The hotel's architecture reflects a blend of Mediterranean revival and beaux arts styles, with its ornate details, majestic domes and intricate marble work. I was not allowed to film inside, but I was able to take photos. The interior features opulent decor, including grand ballrooms, chandeliers and lavish furnishings. Throughout its history, the Millennium Biltmore Hotel has hosted numerous notable events and guests such as Lucille Ball, Henry Fonda and Catherine Hepburn. 
It has served as a backdrop for Hollywood films, award ceremonies, and significant social and political gatherings. Given the opulent decor and history of the hotel, you would think that the room rates are through the roof, but you can actually get some really good deals. And even if you're not staying here, I recommend walking through the hotel. As you can tell, it's quite the sight to see. Alright, moving on. Here we see the original Pantry Cafe, another iconic LA eatery which has been open since 1924. They used to be open 24-7, but it looks like since the pandemic they have adjusted the opening hours and oft times you will encounter a line to get into the diner, which dishes up classic American fare. Even Marilyn Monroe and Dr. Martin Luther King have dined here. And then just a short walk further we get to the Figueroa Hotel, one of the longest standing hotels in downtown LA. Founded in 1926 as a women's only hostel for the YWCA, this building was once a home for female creatives, businesswomen and single mothers who were otherwise not allowed to travel without their significant others. A boldly progressive concept nearly a century ago, the Figueroa has endured as an emblem of change throughout the decades. I used to work with this hotel a lot several years ago while working for a tour operator and back then the owner was Uno, a guy from Finland who had transformed the hotel into a Moroccan themed oasis. I really loved the decor and what Uno created back then. In 2021 Hyatt Hotels bought the property and transformed the hotel once again. It has been restored to its original Spanish Mediterranean glory. The hotel features five food and beverage outlets, grab cocktails at the lobby bar, or as we walk outside on the other side of the hotel, grab a bite at their poolside restaurant. So yeah, it's certainly a nice spot to hang out even if you're not staying at the hotel. And then across the street from the Figueroa Hotel we get to LA Live, a vibrant entertainment complex which offers plenty of dining, nightlife and more. Here we walk by the Grammy Museum which is a must visit for music lovers. I have a dedicated Grammy Museum video on my channel for more information on that. As you walk along here make sure to look down to see the plaques of past Grammy winners. As we walk into the heart of LA Live, we pass Lucky Strike where you can go bowling and then at the main plaza they always have something going on. I was here during the recent Lakers playoff run and they had some fun activities for the fans. In the winter time they put up an ice rink as well. That massive skyscraper here is the JW Marriott and Ritz Carlton which has been part of the impressive LA skyline since 2009. Here at the plaza you also find the Microsoft Theater, a concert venue, and then across the street is the Crypto.com Arena, which most people still refer to as Staples Center where the Lakers and Clippers play basketball and the LA Kings play hockey. That said, the Clippers are building a new arena in Inglewood and are set to open the 2024-25 season over there. In front of the arena you can see the statues of several sports legends. My favorite is definitely the Shaquille O'Neal statue with one of his signature dunks. Alright, now it's time to loop back and head back walking northeast. Here we are at the last bookstore. Now, let me first say that this is not the best area of LA as we get close to Skid Row, an area that contains one of the largest homeless populations in the US. While I think it's still fine going here during the day, I want to point this out and that way you can decide for yourself if you want to include this stop or not. The last bookstore is a renowned independent bookstore known for its vast collection of new and used books, unique ambiance and artistic features. The store was established in 2005 occupying a historic bank building which you'll notice as there are vault rooms adding to the unique charm and character. There are two floors. On the upper floor you will see some cool book sculptures and installations. And this book tunnel has certainly gone viral on social media, but even besides that there is a lot of cool stuff to see. So even if books aren't your thing, I still recommend going here and walking through the store. Besides a plethora of books, you'll also find local artists on the second floor. Within the dedicated art gallery space, these artists showcase their work and the gallery also hosts regular exhibitions and art events. 
All right, and now we get back to the Grand Central Market, which we already saw earlier across the street from Angel's Flight. Grand Central Market is a food hall which has been serving the city since 1917. It's a diverse marketplace that showcases a wide array of global cuisines as well as fresh produce. As you can tell, it's very lively and busy here, so certainly not a spot for a relaxing lunch, but the cool thing is that there are so many different cuisines to choose from. So if you are here with a group, everyone can just get whatever they want. And for all my fellow Germans out there, they even have a Currywurst Bude here. Currywurst is a quick German fast food which is especially popular in Berlin. So we exit the food hall on the other side on South Broadway and then right here across the street is our next stop, the Bradbury Building, a historic architectural gem which was completed in 1893. It stands as a magnificent example of Victorian era design and has earned a place on the National Register of Historic Places. The interior of the building is especially stunning with unique architectural features. The highlight of the building is its five-story atrium, bathed in natural light streaming through a massive skylight. Make sure to pay attention to the ornate ironwork, detailed woodwork and decorative tile patterns adorning the walls, railings and floors. The building has been featured in commercials, TV shows and movies, most notably the classic science fiction film Blade Runner was filmed right here. In general, the building is open to the public, however, they do have events happening here regularly. So at times you might not be able to access or have to pay an entrance fee for specific events. Alright, moving on. Now we are on South Spring Street and in the distance you can once again see City Hall, another historic landmark which was completed in 1928. It serves as the administrative center of the local government. Visitors can explore the public areas of the building and there's also an observation deck on the 27th floor which offers stunning views of Los Angeles and its surrounding areas. And across the street is Grand Park which we already saw earlier from up top when we walked along the Music Center area with the Walt Disney Concert Hall. Now on to the next ethnic neighborhood of our tour, Little Tokyo. The neighborhood's history dates back to the early 1900s when Japanese immigrants settled in the area. Today it's the heart of the largest Japanese American population in North America. In fact, there are only three official Japan towns in the US with the two others being in San Francisco and San Jose. Here's the monument dedicated to astronaut Ellison Onizuka a Japanese-American from Hawaii who was a mission specialist on the Space Shuttle Challenger when it disintegrated during takeoff in 1986. Each year several events are held in Little Tokyo with the Nisei Week Festival being the biggest one. It celebrates Japanese-American culture and history and is held every August. Another big part of preserving the history and culture of Japanese Americans is the Japanese American National Museum. Founded in 1992, the museum covers more than 130 years of Japanese American history. Across from the museum is the Go For Broke National Education Center, where you can learn about the remarkable history of the Japanese American soldiers of World War II. As we continue further, we see the extension of the Museum of Contemporary Art. The other location is actually on Grand Avenue near the Walt Disney Concert Hall, which we saw earlier. The museum's exhibits consist primarily of American and European contemporary art created after 1940. And then, just a little further, we see the Go For Broke Monument as part of the Go For Broke National Education Center, which commemorates Japanese Americans who served in the United States Army during World War II. Undoubtedly, the heart of Little Tokyo is the Japanese Village Plaza. There are several shops and restaurants in this area. It gets quite busy here, especially on the weekends. I tried going to Kura, a revolving sushi bar, but the wait was very long. However, there are plenty of other options. This is the Shabu Shabu House, which was the first Shabu restaurant in North America. Shabu Shabu is a Japanese hot pot dish of thinly sliced meat and vegetables boiled in water and served with dipping sauces. 
I ended up going to Omasa, and let me tell you, the sushi was one of the best I've ever had. The spicy tuna roll was really incredible, so yeah, I can highly recommend this place. On this side of the Japanese Village Plaza, where Omasa is located, you'll see the Little Tokyo Watchtower. And then on this street, which is First Street, you'll find several other eateries. Some of these are quite iconic, and you'll likely encounter lines out the door. This is Daikokuya, which I heard has excellent ramen. And then just a bit further down the street is Fugetsu Do, which has been a family owned and operated confectionery store since 1903. They are known for the Japanese rice cakes, more commonly known as mochi and manchu, which is a sweet bean filled rice cake. Thanks so much for joining me on this extensive tour of downtown Los Angeles, and I hope this helps you plan your visit to LA. Comment down below if you have any questions, and I'm also happy to take you on a tour myself. For details on that, reach out to me via my website, triptipswithchris.com, and I'll send you all of the info. And with that, I say thank you and Dankeschön!